Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Demystifying CICD. Um, I'm very thrilled to have two amazing guests, um, hosts, with me today. Um, it's uh, um, Kelsey Hightower, staff developer advocate with Google, and Melissa McKay, developer advocate with JFrog. We will be with them in a second. I will just um, want to mention a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Um, the first is it's a webinar, so expect to be on mute, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. There is a Q&A panel, and you're welcome to type your questions in any time. Um, I will uh, make sure to pass the questions as time allows in the end of the, um, of the webinar. The webinar is recorded. You will get a video um, uh, after a couple of days after, so you'll be able to re-watch and share. Uh, if you have any technical issues, that's go go ahead and type into Q and A a panel as well. Um, what else? All the all the widgets there on the on your screen are customized. Move them around, minimize, maximize, um, make yourself comfortable. And uh, with that, uh, Melissa and Kelsey, welcome. Take it from there. Hi, hey, Baruch. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I am humbled to be here sharing a stage with Kelsey today, even though it's virtual. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself. I am currently a developer advocate with JFrog. I come from a developer background, so my heart is for developers and their processes and their pains and um, everything they go uh, through day to day. So uh, my goal, at least for this webinar, is to hopefully give you something that you can take back to your teams and uh, make your lives better. Um, I've been doing this for several different uh, positions over the last 20 years. So, um, and the later part of my career, definitely looking more into DevOps and stuff. So this is, um, this is a good time to be talking about this particular subject. All right, I'll move it over to Kelsey. Hey, Kelsey, I'm going to be uh, supporting Melissa and in, in talking about this webinar today. What the, the biggest goals today, I think, are really getting to um, things under the cover, some of the philosophies. So we'll be focused on a particular set of tools today. But I think a lot of what we'll be covering today are going to be a little bit generic. Lots of the fundamentals will be covered. And I'm personally waiting until we get to that Q&A. So hopefully we spark a lot of those questions uh, through the webinar today. Cool. All right. So our agenda, like Kelsey said, is going to be very Q&A heavy, very demo heavy. So we'll start with just a short description of what um, pipelines are, why we need them. And then I'm going to jump directly into a demo. I'm using, like Kelsey said, a particular tool set just because it's convenient to me. But what I really want to highlight are um, stages of the pipeline and how you actually implement um, your processes on your teams. Um, Kelsey and I will have a discussion afterwards, and then we're going to invite questions from the audience. So first and foremost, what is a CICD pipeline? Um, the word pipeline is really overused, especially when you're talking to marketing teams and stuff. So I think that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding on what exactly a pipeline is. Um, Kelsey, do you want to give a short definition of what, what you, how you would define a CI/CD pipeline? Oh, uh, well, I have a couple of definitions. One is I define a CI/CD pipeline as a collection of bash scripts you run in a certain order. <laughs> you know, to awesome. oversimplify it, a lot of people make this such this big complex thing. The way I like to think about these pipelines is really serializing whatever process you have. If your team logs into servers and copies files over and starts an app a certain way, maybe even they build on the server. I wouldn't recommend you do that. But what a lot of these CI CD pipeline tools will allow you to do is to serialize whatever culture or engineering practice you have. So for a lot of people, it's just going to be thinking through the state machine that you already go through and then serializing that into a collection of either mini programs that you put into each stage of that pipeline. And then that just represents the checkpoint in your current process. And that will change over time. So you're not building these pipelines that should last 10 years, right? They should just reflect what you've learned. Awesome. That is an excellent description. And what you just started with, that a pipeline is a, a collection of bash scripts, I really relate to. Um, pipelines are not a new thing. 
there is an explosion of products out there right now that you know are pushing pipelines. You need you need to you know get our product and and we'll help you with your pipelines. Um, I think really the effort is on efficiency and reliability. There are some advantages to automating, um, but it's important to understand like you're already using a pipeline. Every software team is already using a pipeline, whether it's a collection of bash scripts, whether it is a tool that makes your life a little bit easier, um, whether you're just doing everything manually. Like you said, a pipeline is just that. It's just the steps that you're taking to progress software from development all the way to production. All right, um, just really quickly, uh, do you have an opinion on like why now? Like why, it seems it's a fairly recent thing that a lot of these products are hitting the market right now for CI/CD pipelines. This is a very popular term right now if you Google CI/CD, and it's assumed that everyone knows what that is. Um, let's define really quick what CI means and what CD means. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, they don't understand it. So a lot of the things that we don't understand are the things we want to talk about, right? That's where all the hype comes into, right? Like it means whatever you want it to mean, right? Or it means whatever I want to sell you. Um, so for a lot of people, uh, continuous integration is probably going to be uh, their main goal, right? They're going to probably just focus on checking in code, building it and running their test, making sure everything is good. Depending on how you describe continuous delivery, there are going to be very few companies on earth that can check in a piece of code, have enough test covers that they can actually trust and just go all the way to production. Like that, that is like, unless you're just doing like a little blog, you know, maybe you're working yeah. for the marketing team and you're just publishing content after a quick review, uh, it just goes off on its own. I think that makes a lot of sense, but the more behavior you have, I think the less likely you're gonna just be able to click a button and go all the way without some really great rollback mechanisms. So I think the reason why now um, now I think the targets that you're deploying to, right? We used to deploy to these servers that required a lot of scripting. Now we have these API driven platforms like Kubernetes, Docker, serverless platforms, et cetera. It's making it much easier for the tail in the pipeline to actually be completed. So I think this is why a lot of people are now are like, wow, maybe we can try this again and be successful. That makes sense. Um, the continuous integration piece is definitely near and dear to my heart just because I'm closer to that front end developer activity. And I'm totally in agreement with you about continuous development or continuous deployment or, or delivery. Um, and that's something to mention really quick. Continuous deployment, very different than continuous delivery. Um, continuous deployment could also be defined as uh, continually deploying to a, a test cluster, for example in order for your test team to you know, go over everything before it gets pushed to prod. So yeah, there's a bunch of intermediate steps and um, I agree with you that it is not very often that you're going to see a pipeline that actually runs from beginning to end without something happening in between. And this is probably the area people get in the most trouble. Uh, they have CICD strategies <laughs> or initiatives once you start going down that path, you may start to get into copy and paste mode. Oh, this is what Netflix is doing, so let's do that. Or this is what other companies are doing, so let's do that. You're kind of missing the point. You almost have to park this label that we've assigned to this practice to the side. And you almost have to get on a whiteboard and say, what is our process now? And what would we like our process to be? And once you get agreement on that, then you turn to these tools to make it happen. It works in that order, not the other order. With that, I'm moving on to why do I need a CI CD pipeline? I think we covered this pretty much already with some of these benefits that we've talked about. Um, again, it's not really a question of why you need one. You already have one. So how can you make it better? How can you automate pieces of your process to make your life easier, make things more reliable, um, improve efficiency, remove some bottlenecks? Um, also, um, you said something about copying and pasting stuff. Um, there is definitely something to be said about using reusable components, but like you said, make sure that it works for you. Um, it needs to follow you know, your process. Don't come up with something, some newfangled thing, right? 
and then try to force your project into that box. Um, yeah, I, think, I think Melissa brought up a good point. You already have a pipeline. This question is really about, do you want to be intentional about that pipeline? And that's really where a lot of the hard work comes into uh, play. That makes sense. Something that we might um, talk about a little bit later, too, is uh, deployment, having a deployment pipeline. That doesn't necessarily begin all the way you know, at code commit, but you might have a pipeline that just makes it easier for ops to deploy your software and um, making your life easier for a rollback, right? If something does go wrong, if something makes it out into prod, if you have a pipeline set up that is just, you know, makes it easy to deploy and to roll back, I think you're going to sleep better at night. Yeah, make sure we understand that we're not talking about building one long golden pipeline here. It's more of like building Rube Goldberg machines. Uh, things yes. are going to knock over other things. That's the reality of it. And I think this is where a lot of people trip up. Like, oh, look at my pipeline. But really, once you're done, it's going to look like these uh, Rube Goldberg machines that uh, look like someone set up a bunch of dominoes and you keep knocking them over. <laughs> I like that description. All right, well, enough about that. Now that we have a background on what pipelines are, why you might want to look into this, why you even care, let's uh, go ahead and jump into a demo. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And all right, here we go. You should be able to see my screen now. All right, so what this is in front of you, this is just the login to this environment that I'm using. I'm using um, the JFrog platform, which includes um, artifact management. Uh, we do have a um, security tool called X-Ray in there as well that um, I'll demonstrate a little bit of later. And um, pipelines, JFrog pipelines, which I'm really excited about just because uh, when I started at JFrog is right when pipelines was released. So I've been jumping in and, and playing with a few things, trying some things out, just seeing how easy it is for me coming from a developer background to really set something up that I think would be helpful. So um, this sandbox has a lot of tools and stuff already in it. A lot of stuff is already set up. It's um, hosted on the Google Cloud platform, which makes it even better And in my mind. Um, it's been really reliable for me to use and try and um, add my own pipelines to. Uh, moving on, um, after I've logged in, um, my first step was to create my pipeline. Now, I'm, I think most of you can relate that uh, I'm a lot better at learning by example. So the very first thing I did is go online and try to find an example of a pipeline that made sense that I could modify for my environment. And JFrog has a really good um, collection of examples to use, which I found one in their pipeline documentation that is actually, um, the scenario is there's a Java backend project and a Vue frontend project and the two of these projects, um, they have separate teams working on them. They have separate you know, commit uh, repos that they commit to. And then the two projects are combined and containerized into a Docker container. And then that is the artifact, the end artifact that would be deployed to production. So to start with, I needed three repositories. So I pulled in this project, this Java backend example project into one repository. Um, I pulled in the view front end into a separate repository to represent these are separate separate team uh, responsibilities. And then a third project is the actual pipeline. And um, one thing that I just want to note here is it definitely is in a different repository. We can talk about you know, the pros and cons of that um, when we start discussing this. But this is the meat of the pipeline. It has a set of resources and it has a set of steps. And the steps are basically the, the real life processes that the software needs to go to in order to get to your end artifact. The resources are things like integrations that I need. Um, they control um, authentication. Um, uh, like I needed to use you know, my GitHub token in order to get access to these repositories. And I also needed um, you know, artifactory authentication so that I can get access in order to pull and push um, any of the resources that I need during builds. So um, 
The very first thing I needed to do was set up integrations. As I mentioned before, there were a couple that I needed right away, uh, my artifactory integration in order to uh, set up my authentication there. And then this one was really important, my GitHub integration in order to um, get access to my GitHub repos. The next thing I needed to do was set up and connect my pipeline source. So basically it just uh, grabs from the pipeline repo the latest, um, let's go ahead and open this, we can look at it. It just grabs the latest uh, pipeline file that I have in my repo in order to use it for the pipeline. As soon as I do that, and this the first thing I wanted to do was just get it to start working so that I can see when I commit some code that, um, that it's actually gonna trigger the pipeline. Um, and if we go and look at it, once that pipeline source is synced, it actually brings me to a really good visual of the steps of my pipeline. As you can see, I've been playing with this quite a bit, trying different things, moving things around. Um, but for the uh, triggering mechanism, this is pretty cool because in the pipeline YAML, which I can get to here, these resources, these Git repo resources, as soon as they get pulled in, they actually create a webhook in the background. I didn't even realize that happened. I knew there needed to be something, you know, I went to create one actually. And when I came in here, there was already one created for me. And um, this one is created such that it will trigger on pull requests, on pushes and releases. Um, pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and trigger this. Uh, I'm just gonna resend one of these. just so I can show you the triggering mechanism. Go back to my pipeline here. Um, the same happened with the view front end. Uh, there was also a, a webhook that gets created there. So basically the steps of this pipeline, which I'll make this bigger so we can all see it. The first thing I'm gonna do, uh, there's, there's two paths here. Right now I've triggered the Java backend to run. Um, the, the view front end has a trigger as well, and it's separated into a few steps here. It, it builds it, packages it up, and then publishes the artifact into Artifactory so that I can access it later. Um, this step, this is a Maven project, and it's actually building and also uh, deploying an artifact to Artifactory. Um, the next step, which is the fun one I wanna get to is when those two projects are composed into a Docker container. And that Docker container is then um, pushed to Artifactory and we actually publish build info on that. Um, build info is really important. It, it gives you your manifest of everything that was included in that build. I think for any pipeline, it's really important to know what, what your builds are, where they came from, what is in them. This way you can know exactly uh, what artifacts are being deployed to production at any time. You can also do comparisons um, between uh, a build info uh, earlier and a build info later in order to do any troubleshooting. Um, this particular pipeline, after publishing the build info, uh, it actually promotes the entire artifact into a staging repository. This is a repository where you know uh, you can have a, another pipeline perhaps that deploys the staging artifact into a staging environment, and then you can continue on your way to get this out to production. Uh, really quickly, I want to show you what the build info looks like. It's in the artifactory section. Uh, this is my latest build here. I can drill all the way down into it and I can get a list of all of my artifacts that I have. Pretty cool stuff. Um, Artifactory is uh, it's more than just storage. It's an entire database full of useful information. Um, the important thing is to learn how to use that information in order to uh, be more efficient. Uh, really quickly, uh, 
These are the repos that I set up. Um, I did set up a few new ones in order to show uh, just this demo application to show artifacts being deployed. Um, here's, for example, um, here's some artifacts that got deployed to our demo uh, repositories. And then these are artifacts that are promoted into our staging repository. All right, so enough about that. Now that we have um, our pipeline here, I'd like to just run through each of these steps and discuss what might be missing here. Um, as demos go, uh, and this happens to me all the time, you go to a conference or a webinar or something, you get this awesome demo and all of these things are, are showed to you and then you try to go and implement them at your job and there's all kinds of problems. There's reasons why you can't do exactly what they've demoed. So those are some things, some touch points I wanna hit today with Kelsey. All right, so this first one, Super important, um, source control integration. Um, Kelsey, do you have, uh, when, when were you first, this is gonna be a long time ago, I'm sure, uh, as it is for me, but when were you first exposed to continuous integration, this idea of committing your code to source code repository and then having automated activities happen? Oh, yeah, it was a while ago. I would probably say maybe 13 years ago. You know, around that time, this is when Subversion was still the, the hotness. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were coming from CVS and upgrading to Subversion like that was the, the new hotness and was going to change the world. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, we got to the point where, especially in the Java world, you had so many artifacts that need to be strung together to even build an app. Right, you have all these jar files, you have these dependencies, and you have all, and, and I don't know, the, the Java community seemed to have like a billion dependencies. So the build tool chain was very important. And I think, it, I, don't, I don't know if you can even <laughs> build a Java app without some form of automation, nor write Java code without an IDE. So I think this kind of tooling became really prevalent during that time because you just really needed tools to assist you. Right, that makes sense. Um, a lot of these demos now use use Git. That seems to be, I mean, that's the go-to when you're talking about source control and stuff. Um, everything I use today, it goes through Git, but definitely SVN is still very strong out there. Um, and maybe it helps to explain why Git, I think for a lot of people, it's like, what's the difference? And I think mm -hmm. the ecosystem, I mean, big props to people like GitHub and Bitbucket and all these folks, they really changed the game and up-leveled the fact that now these things were kind of built with the cloud mindset that there's going to be HTTP webhooks, you can get notifications, this concept of a pull request. There's just so many hooks into the pipeline process, the way branches are just lightweight now, that you can actually just go ahead and kick off a build just for a branch and just be a very cheap operation. So I think a lot of this is being driven by the ecosystem around Git, not just the actual protocol and how we version control assets. That makes sense. My first experience with continuous integration um, actually included some interesting feedback when a build failed or when tests failed. And that's something that was missing in this pipeline that I just demoed. Is it was it's cool to see, you know, um, a commit go through and then see it, see it get built. But what happens when a test fails? Um, in that particular pipeline that I demoed, there's there's no step for that. There was no step for running unit tests, which I think is a really good time to do that, is in the very beginning of your pipeline. Um, the first time I was introduced to it was, goodness, also about 13 years ago, and it was with a very, very tiny company. We had a server room in a closet, and we would commit our code, and we were using Subversion, we commit our code and the project would build. And inside that closet, if a test failed, it would sound an alarm. I mean, a physical alarm, a loud alarm. <laughs> and it was really embarrassing. So it really encouraged us to make sure that our unit tests pass before we commit code. Um, another thing that you brought up is um, just the whole idea of pull requests. 
I've been on teams where we didn't use that strategy. Um, I kind of, I think it's pretty standard now to use pull requests, but it wasn't too long ago I was on a team that did not do that. And the uh, process you'd go through each day is, um, they had good continuous integration, of course, um, you know, all a huge team, lots of developers checking in. But you would come in every morning, and the first thing you do is check your email to make sure that things aren't broken before you pull all of the latest code. So uh, do you have any opinions about the whole pull request strategy or how you should protect that mainline branch to keep one person from blocking 50 other developers? Yeah, a lot of people just forbid, you know, pushing directly to the, to the main branch. Um, and really it's all about collaboration that you're really trying to get towards, right? We're in the world now where we say a lot of teams will contribute. Maybe we get this from the open source community, right? Where even mm -hmm. though I don't work on that particular project, I have a dependency on that project, therefore I may want to contribute to it. So in that particular world, we need a better way to collaborate. And honestly, throwing code at the main branch is probably not the best way uh, to collaborate, especially if you're disrupting someone. Uh, but giving people an opportunity, like you said, if I can actually describe what healthy code looks like, maybe I run integration tests before it's allowed to be merged into the main branch. But not a lot of people know how to run the integration tests, and sometimes they're very expensive to run. So being able to run them centrally, I think, is key. But I think it's all motivated at that top end around collaboration uh, versus just like blocking people's access to the main branch. That makes sense. Um, a, one strategy that I've seen used that's been really successful is just uh, there's a lot of um, webhooks and a lot of ways to uh, notify. I mean, even just using Git, it's really it's possible to uh, open a pull request, run all the tests are going to be run in the background, and then the user, the committer, is notified if there are any problems. The actual pull request is highlighted so that everyone else looking at it knows not to merge that in. Um, you could block merges. Um, I have seen some problems with that, though, if, if, you know, there might be a reason why something might not be passing, you might want to push it in anyway. I, if you've got a, a fire you're trying to put out, that might be a, a reason why blocking the mainline branch might not be such a good idea for everyone. Yeah, there's lots of scenarios where you're going to break glass. You'll, you'll see this into your, your pipelines. We didn't talk about that here, but there's going to be emergency changes that need to go regardless of the pipeline. Every company's like, no, we'll never do that. Yeah, you will. Someone's going to get a VP <laughs> exception. You're going to have to push directly. And it's going to be very important that you can actually reconcile what happened later on. So in your next push that goes through the pipeline, uh, can you capture those emergency changes in the way where the next push to the pipeline doesn't undo all of them? That's just going to be a thing you think about with any form of automation. Yep. That makes sense. Um, let's see. So just committing to the main line isn't enough. So we need to be able to run unit tests. We need to be able to get some feedback. Um, I think we pretty much exhausted this subject. But Kelsey, do you see anything else missing in our pipeline that was demoed for this piece? Nope. And I think our pipeline actually reflects the fact you know it's a demo. Um, yeah. So whatever your build steps are, whatever the tools you need, whatever your process is, uh, if you look at these kind of resources, notice that there's just a list of things. And typically, mm -hmm. these lists are in a particular order. And I always find myself going in there and finding the right place to interject the missing step. So just understand that these things are living representations of your pipeline, and don't be afraid to, to change them when necessary. Makes sense. All right, let's take a quick look at these steps. Um, there were a few steps for the front end view. There was a build step, a packaging step, and then the actual publishing step was separated out. Um, I guess one thing I liked about this was just having that separation so that you know exactly where something went wrong, whether if it was just the packaging stage or just the building stage, um, and then, of course, publishing being separate. Um, one thing that that pipeline that I demoed did not have was any reaction to failures. So it was definitely happy case scenario. Um, and a lot of the, the pipeline solutions out there, um, they include you know, what to do on execution, what to do before, what to do when it's successful, what to do when the step fails. 
and then what to do if there's any cleanup necessary on completion. Um, so important, I think, to include what to do on failure. Um, some things to think about, it, will the rest, does it make sense to run any part of the pipeline after this? I mean, once a step fails, it seems like you're blocked from that point until you fix that step, you're blocked, you can't do anything else. So uh, considering what to do when a particular step fails is important. Um, is there anything else that someone might want to do um, during this phase prior to making an artifact available for use by a QA team or anyone else? Um, no, I think this is pretty straightforward, but I do like the fact that you have this very explicit, you know, packaging step, right? I think a lot of times if you add this step very explicitly, who cares what happens on the front end or how people work? But when you get to the point where you're publishing these artifacts, then you can actually set up policies about what to do with those artifacts. And I think you may be getting into that in the next couple of slides or so. Okay. What about um, like code quality checks at this point? What do you see used a lot in, in people's environments these days for things that might take a little longer? So a developer might wanna just continue doing their stuff, right? And get some stuff committed. But in the background, you might be able to include an automation step that does some code quality checks. Um, yeah, you can do those, but I think the, I still believe the number one code quality check is the humans. Um, we True. can do a really good job because one thing that I like at Google, I learned about this thing called readability. And one thing we try to do is teach other developers what our style guides are even though something may pass an automated linter or code quality check tool, there's gonna to be a certain style that we write for a certain reason. And sometimes you might write ugly looking code, but it's high performance. And there's gonna be a reason why we make that trade off even in our code bases that might be a little bit more brittle. So I think just having that step sometimes um, in Google, we have this concept of you need someone that understands the project. So maybe someone in the owner's file, but and then you also need someone with readability. And that person could either be the same person that's on that team, or it could be someone from the language team that just understands that language pretty really well, and it's a teaching tool. So I, I would tell people, don't miss the opportunity to train each other by trying to push it all off into an automation tool. It just it just changes the, the quality of your developers as well when they get to review code and look for those readability issues. That totally makes sense. And I like what you say about you know pushing that more to the front of your pipeline with the actual person instead of leaving that to machines. Um, there's a lot of learning to be had, a lot of um, mentoring to be done at that stage. Um, one thing as far as I, I understand the value of the code quality checks and things like that, but here's something that happened to me on a team um, not terribly long ago. Um, and it has to do with a project that had been alive for quite a, quite a long time. And pipelines were, the automated steps of these pipelines were just being integrated. The problem was, there were a lot of problems with this code that were old. And there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it mentality, because it was pretty fragile. So introducing a step into the pipeline that did code quality checks actually caused us more harm than good for a while. So the first thing that happened, and this, this goes back to deciding what to do on success or on failure. The first thing that happened was, uh, this was a Java project. And one, one of the code quality checks, which are manually configured by the way, so you can decide what's important and what is not important. And that's a whole nother session. But the first thing, the default settings of this project was to alert every time there was a generic exception. Well, a catch-all exception. Well, those were all over the code base. So the build would fail every time it would hit that quality check. It was really irritating. Um, and then to fix it, unfortunately, instead of having that collaboration up front to really understand and learn what that means to have a generic exception, um, it was assigned to junior engineers to go fix it. So if you can imagine all of those generic exceptions were changed to specific exceptions, 
which during run time was not a good thing. So that was a huge learning experience for our team. So just something I wanna throw in there about pipelines. Um, some of these tools, they're cool to put in, but they are absolutely no guarantee that you are gonna get a better quality uh, product at the end or that you're not just gonna you know, block your progress a little bit. So for a while, if you want to see how that goes, you might want to just go ahead and continue with your pipeline, maybe notify of any problems and adjust that as necessary, but continue on with your pipeline and don't just fail on every single alert. All right. Um, the other thing too is um, I just want to throw in here just having a way to manage your artifacts. Um, of course, I'm using Artifactory, but um, making sure that your uh, repositories are ready for you to use, that they're organized in such a way that your developers can have access to them and use them. Um, this was fairly new to me, and we'll, I'd like to discuss this a little bit later when we talk about teams um, and how they're organized. Uh, I didn't have access to a lot of these things, so I didn't really understand what was going on under the covers. So uh, when the whole you know, DevOps mentality came about and uh, came down on developers to learn more of these tool sets and understand how they work, I started to realize how much trouble we were causing our operations teams by putting things in random repositories or uh, creating new ones that weren't even in the same instance that uh, production was deploying from, you know, all of those little details need to be considered. Uh, I think this is a super important point for a lot of people. Um, uh, trying to think of a good analogy. So I do a lot of the grocery shopping and you ever go to a grocery store and you buy a thing that you already have. you like, you have two of them already. <laughs> one is unopened. Now you have a third and there's no way you're going to get to the third one before the other two expire. So now you're just like, why did I do that? And it's because you didn't really check for what you had before you went to the grocery store, right? You're just browsing the aisles like, oh, I need one of those. So you just buy it because just like code, it's fairly cheap to keep adding new ingredients to our software stack, either in the form of libraries, the form of duplication. So a lot of enterprises, if I ask, do you know of all the binaries and apps you have? And it's like, no, there's no one place where that lives. So I, I like the fact that these days people are introducing this concept of the artifact repository or a registry where all your software is. And then bonus points if you know what the software actually does. Bonus points if you actually know where it's deployed, right? So I think a lot of people still have a lot of steps to go there, but just it's very empowering to be able to see all the stuff that you already have because it may point to, and especially as part of your code review, you can say, hey, we already have two of those type of things returning the same type of data. Why are you writing this code again? Right, so a lot of that goes into the overall health of software development as a whole. Very, very good points. Um, some of the database uh, capabilities of Artifactory is to provide a lot of that information. How, how often is this particular artifact being downloaded? Um, by what teams? What builds is it being included in? All of that stuff. Um, last thing to mention, and this goes with your grocery store analogy. Um, it is super easy just to grab libraries from anywhere. Um, it is good in your pipelines if you can always push from cache or um, pull from caches that you have, as opposed to always reaching out to the internet to pull um, dependencies or libraries that you need during your pipeline. Countless times I've been in a situation where that wasn't understood on the developer side. So by the time the code gets in to the pipeline, it's trying to reach out to the internet. It's either successful or very much not successful and the whole pipeline is broken now and you never get your build. Or so even worse, uh, a lot of enterprises spend a lot of cash on security tools, like a lot of on security. And then you look in the pipeline and they're downloading software from the safe internet yeah. on every build and yeah. it just takes one developer to be like you know i'm just going to put a backdoor in this json library and all of a sudden every enterprise is continuously pushing my vulnerability into production without thinking twice because to be honest i know very few people in the world who actually reads the source code of the things that they depend on it's a yeah. you know they have this kind of strategy like hope and if it goes wrong hopefully someone tells me about it and i'll 
update to the latest version. Yep. That is a really good lead in to our next subject here, containerizing. So a couple of things I want to talk about here. Um, it's this, the Docker file for this particular container actually lives in the Maven project. I don't know that that's appropriate. It worked for the demo. Um, do you think the actual containerizing of apps, especially if you have an application that is composed of several different things, where do you think that responsibility lies? This one's tricky, right? Because the one thing no one thinks about when they're first building this stuff is what do you do for an existing version that's already out there that needs a small update? So let me just kind of think about that for a second. A lot of times in these Docker files, people are bringing in third-party dependencies or updating the base layer to some other layer. So what happens when you want the exact same software, but you just want to change some of the dependencies? And in that case, the Docker file will be different. If you only have one Docker file on your main branch, that's going to evolve at the top of that tree, right? Maybe you're doing a lot of new development and it's going to require a new Docker file. And a lot mm -hmm. of times you just don't have the right setup to really maintain two Docker files. So you got to be really conscious about this. I don't mind it living in the same repo, but when you branch, it's not just the code that you may need to update. Just like make files are passed, you may have to keep track of like the changes you're doing between the two Docker files. Right, so mm -hmm. you're going to update the one Docker file on this particular release branch. You may have to go ensure that you push it back to main so that those things are also updated, right? So it's a very tricky process because if your Docker file has way too much logic in it, you're going to find yourself maintaining multiple branches of Docker files just in case you got to release a dot release of existing software that co can't come from main. That makes sense. Yeah, that can get pretty complicated. Um, especially like you say, when you want to add, you know, little changes. Um, one thing to mention about Artifactory is that the way that it stores Docker containers is pretty cool. It actually stores by layer. So you aren't having, you know, if a layer has actually changed, then it's, um, it's stored as a separate entity. Um, if it has not, then the layer itself is a dependency to later uh, Docker containers. It's, it's a pretty interesting way of doing things, and I, I've really liked how that's worked so far. Um, the last also, point I want to throw on the containerized piece, mm -hmm. don't over-optimize your world on this section. This is a really fancy tarball with metadata in it, built for efficiency. So this container packaging, the first time in my lifetime in tech, to see that we standardize on a particular packaging, right? Python, there's eggs. Ruby has gems. Uh, depending on your language of choice, it's going to have its own packaging for its own artifacts. And then maybe your OS will have another one like RPMs. I think Docker, if you look at it, it's basically admitting that statically linked binaries were probably the right thing that you want to deploy around. So this is like no matter what you believe, this is like creating a static binary for all languages and runtimes that includes its dependencies. So don't over-index here because maybe in 10 years, we might have a replacement at this section. And if you build your pipelines appropriately, then everything should work in the front of that pipeline. The thing that produces the self-contained artifact may change, and you don't have to go and scramble and have a whole new CICD strategy because this little packaging piece changed. And I think a lot of people I see are making this mistake that they believe everything is about Docker and Docker is the only way they can deploy software that isn't quite true. That makes sense. Um, it can definitely make things more complicated if you haven't thought this through. Uh, there's one thing that I want to share that I just thought of, and it it's, um, has to do with um, before you actually produce an artifact that is available to be tested on or whatever. Um, something you mentioned a little bit earlier was uh, you know pulling in all of these third-party libraries and stuff. And, um, containerizing like this definitely makes that even more difficult because now you have this Docker container, no telling what's in it. Um, there's a feature that um, the platform has called X-Ray that I want to show you very quickly and then I'll get out of it. Um, let me share my screen here again.
All right, so I'm gonna go to an actual build that was stored during the pipeline. And I'm going to drill down into, uh, I think this one maybe. So we have um, this security scanner, which scans binaries and it actually pulls in a lot of the, um, you know, um, alerts and stuff that you might get um, either from security or from licensing, um, this kind of stuff. And, you know, you have, especially with like the Maven project, um, let's take a look at this one specifically. In the Maven project, there was a dependency that was pulled in. You, didn't, you don't see it directly in the POM file. You would have to have done a dependency, a dependency tree and you know, did your research to figure out if there were any problems with anything being pulled in. Um, and this particular one you know, has, has a security problem with it. Um, it's really cool that this product can go that deep into a container and you can see exactly what layer in that container is a problem and what library is a problem. And then, you know, at that point, you need to figure out what to do. Um, be mindful. I mean, there's a lot of these. So you can set up your scanning. Uh, again, consider what happens when your scan fails, what happens when your scan succeeds. I guarantee that for a lot of projects, you put this scanner on there, you're going to find a lot of things in the beginning. So for a while, you might just want to, you know, notify your developers that there are problems with the li these libraries. But then there needs to be a, an actual plan to go through and replace them as necessary. Um, those decisions need to be made by the security team. Um, that's all I wanted to show there. I'm looking at the time. Do you think we want to leave a lot of time for the Q&A? I know a lot of people join these webinars um, yes. you know, to get their questions answered. So you want to you want to jump into that? We have, we have tons of questions, like tons. Let's, Let's move right it. in. I'm gonna skip our last slide here. It's about promotion. I think we've we've talked about that a little bit, moving moving the software along. Uh, and then here are some subjects that uh, you know we might want to talk about. As you said, we have a lot of questions coming in, so let's just get right down to it. Baruch is going to be our MC for questions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and as I mentioned, there are a lot. Um, there are two main categories. The ones are very technical about JFrog pipelines, and I think we will skip those, and we will make sure that everybody get an answer probably through a follow-up email with with the technical details that they care about uh, for uh, JFrog pipelines. And uh, the others, I try to group um, into more conceptual questions that will cover more, uh, more than one question from the audience, and hopefully we will get to a lot of them uh, now. Now, what I wanted to suggest, and this is something that um, we discussed earlier, so uh, if you look right there, the DevOps Speakeasy is the name of the podcast that uh, I co-host with uh, Kat Cosgrove, and I wanted to suggest you both, Melissa and Kelsey, to join me in an episode of the DevOps Speakeasy to discuss even more, because obviously we won't be able to get to all the questions in the next 10 minutes. So, um, folks, for the audience, uh, keep an eye on the DevOps Speak Easy podcast and expect an episode with uh, Kelsey and Melissa discussing more of the of the great stuff that we mentioned today. And all the links will be in the follow up email. Let's get to the questions. So. Uh, the first question that a lot of people wonder, not only today, but in general, uh, what do you think about the difference between continuous deployment and continuous delivery? Um, are they the same thing? If not, what is the difference? And what wh what you should use when? Yeah, I'm going to keep my answers super short so we can get through a lot of them. Uh, I will tell people it just doesn't matter at all. Who cares? Like, seriously, if you sit there and spend another six months debating this, trying to understand it, you're literally, literally wasting time. The best thing you can do is look at the process you have, look at the process you want. And a lot of times, they don't need to be so far apart. It's like releasing software. What is the 1.1 release of your current process? Some people, if you're doing everything manually, how about we get to a point where when you check in code, you're building artifacts, and then teams can manually pull from the artifact store and deploy it manually. 
And then when you get a little bit more time and you're used to that and got that nice software catalog, the next thing you could do is like, well, let's take that manual process and make another step that you can just push the button whenever someone feels like they want to go and deploy something, right? Maybe you manually type in the path to that artifact and the pipeline keeps a record of the transaction. That's a step forward. And if you keep with this model, you'll be doing both. You'll be doing whatever someone says it means. But the main thing you'll be doing is actually getting some value out of the software and not wasting time with the philosophical debate. Yeah, that's a good point, but let me just put it out there. There is a philosophical debate about it, and it's debate of the big green button, right? The, this this last approval. So let's say we did this um, iterative approach, and we ended up in the when we are almost certain in our pipeline, and it most of the time produces the quality that we want. Do should we have this last manual step? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we strive to get rid of it, or should we the other way around, as you both mentioned, embrace the fact that people know how to check certain stuff that the machines can't? I would say every automation pipeline, if you go into a factory, there's a button to stop things. And that button has to exist. So whether you go with the default of automated end to end with the big stop button or you automate end to end with a big green button, right? So all automation control, just the theory of automation, tends to have a way to stop the train. That's just like part of automation because something will break. That's the, that's the cord on the Toyota production floor that ever, anyone can pull if, if they see something is wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. One thing I wanted to mention along those lines, um, just the continuous deployment piece. Um, it is, you know, it's nice. It's nice to be able to have your pipeline go end to end. Rarely is that the case, though. There's so many tests um, that I can think of that are just not possible yet to be automated. Um, I was on a, a project that had to do with video for a long time, and, you know, if you wanted to train a camera to learn what bad video looks like, I, that was that was a really challenging problem. I mean, we we definitely had to go through that QA piece. Um, the other thing is too, though, that's worth worth saying, the advantage of having the one click deploy. You should be able to have a one click rollback as well. Um, be able to, you know, if a problem gets out there, fix it quickly. And that's a whole back and forth. Should you let problems get out there ever, or should you focus more on fixing them as quickly as you can when they happen, because they do? Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Another very popular bunch of questions is around GitOps, ChatOps, issue ops, and the other types of ops that kind of integrate the different tools that you work with and in, in general, into your pipeline, triggering the pipeline, stopping the pipeline, contributing to the pipeline. What do you think about all those and uh, which of them makes sense and which of them is just another buzzword, attach ops to everything? Yeah, I think people, it's just workflows. I know people don't like the simplicity of the fact that it's just a workflow. If you need all of these ideas, I think it's the way we share ideas as humans, especially when we have marketing departments. Like, here's my workflow. I happen to have my version control system in the middle of my workflow. So let's give it a name and maybe even give it a logo. That's cool. But at the fundamental thing, these are just workflows. And a lot of times you'll actually find that you're already doing the thing being described by one of these names. So for a lot of people, you may look at these workflows that are pre-canned as a maybe a starting point for new ideas. Like an artist will go to an art gallery. Yeah, that's okay but just make sure you understand the fundamentals. We're just talking about workflows and these patterns are just ways to incorporate them uh, to your workflows. I'm gonna answer one of the questions that I saw pop up. Why are the different repos important? So you can have those different workflows. It's really hard to have a lot of workflows with one repository. Then you start doing regular expressions, doing this weird stuff about this path. But when you start to build clean pipelines, you know, usually pipes have fittings in between. So when one section breaks, you don't break, you don't have to replace the whole house, right? So you build these things modular in a way so they can be attached and they can be expanded by having those little connectors or even elbow joints when you have to move them around things. 
So you got to think in modularity when you start thinking about this stuff, and it's just workflows. Yeah, this is this is very true. But also, um, once you start compartmentalize those repos, you run into another problem that again was brought up in 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 number of um, number of questions. What if we have not only different repos but but different approaches? To, to different branching strategies, main branch against feature branches, or um, different builds. But in the end of the day, you need to build one product. How all those completely different creatures can be integrated into one pipeline that actually makes sense? Just like your software, every function may do something different in its body. They have inputs and they have outputs. So if you want to do one branching strategy for this library and one branching strategy for your doc, doesn't matter. One's going to take some input source code. How you got to the source code doesn't matter. That's the function. Inputs and outputs. This is why we build pipelines with triggers. Someone push something to this branch. How you decide to do it. If you overcomplicate this with like, oh, there's a philosophy for each of these. I'm not going to belabor the point. Their workflow <laughs> engine, the people who came up with these names got to work, did something, and shared their patterns. So if you want to be as productive as those people, then you have to get to work first. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do like, you know, implementing everything is never a good solution. You need to implement the things that are going to work for you. Focus on your bottlenecks that you have in your process and improve those. And taking this as, you know, a recipe that things should be done this way and these steps uh, can really be a blocker on a lot of projects and really slow things down and upset people at both ends, the ops and the developers. All these questions remind me, like people are really sitting around debating about, should we use a hammer or <laughs> nails or a screwdriver for this project when really they should be designing the house they want to live in. And I think, right. I think just people are just not comfortable with the big picture sometimes. Oh, absolutely. We love the technology. We love to, to dig very, very deeply because this is where the fun is. We became software engineers because this is what we are excited about. So obviously, every time we have the opportunity to dig into deep technical discussions about stuff, we will do it just because this is what we enjoy. This is, this is very true. But uh, here, is, here is a more of a concept, um, conceptual question for you. We spoke about the importance of uh, reviewing the pull requests, learning from them, debating, debating them. But in the end of the day, this is exactly what we just spoke, that we need to be very careful in not digging into too deep on it. We can argue about names of variables or using spaces against a tabs for the entire life. How do we make those reviews uh, useful, but not, you know, just time sacking uh, uh, and, and, and counterproductive? Don't make rules up on the fly. Right. If someone comes up and has an argument about tabs versus spaces, go write it down. Which one are we doing? All right, write it down. We all agree. Well, if we don't agree, we're going to make a decision. We're doing tabs here. That's what we're doing, right? So it's a doc that says this is what we're doing. So then maybe that's what you put in the automated tool because we've already agreed. And if you don't do it, it's just, hey, go read this wiki entry. If you want to belabor the point, we've recorded 10,000 hours of discussions on it. We're kind of done with that. So tabs it is because we've got other stuff to do. Uh, but when you start making up rules on the fly is when it starts becoming a waste of time. Yeah, agreed. And I think we have like two minutes left or one minute left. And I wanted to ask you the question that is kind of hearing your opinions on what are the worthy quality gates to implement in Default, everything is changed. Everything is different, but kind of default or out of the box pipeline, both so, uh, quality, security, code style, or anything else? I'll let Melissa take this one. Okay. okay. Um, so I put a slide up here just for our, see, our um, if you want to go play with this a little bit more later, here's some an option for you. Um, quality gates, I definitely lean more toward the beginning. So uh, I think anything having to do with security, you need to handle that at the very beginning. So before an artifact is even ready for like a QA platform, let's go ahead and get a security scan on it. Um, there's even like IDE plugins that you can use um, to help with that and tell you right away, 
if there's a problem with a library that you want to use or pull into your application, things like that. Um, anything that can be handled earlier on in the pipeline is better, and especially um, in smaller doses. You don't want to wait till the very end and then do an entire security scan that takes five days. So there's, there's one example of a quality gate. I don't know if we have time. I want to answer this question about Docker shouldn't be your strategy. If you've been around long enough, it was VMs were a strategy. I remember people were use, even using Packer, packaging up VM images to use as artifacts to deploy. Every couple of years, maybe five to 10, there's going to be a new way of doing the same thing, and for good reason, because we need to evolve. But every checkpoint, people believe that they need to rethink CICD around that technology. And the concepts that we're talking about have nothing to do with one technology. Most pipelines will deploy to mainframes if you got those, VMs, and containers. And when the new thing comes out, you might find yourself deploying to all four of those things. So it's not like this tool should be centered around it. The fundamentals are about capturing your workflow and your process. And that thing at the last mile, whether it's a Docker thing that takes Docker images or something that takes zip files if you're using Lambda, that doesn't really matter because all of this is fundamentally the same. So if you're like, oh, we're going to have a Docker strategy to drive our CICD strategy, then what about all the other stuff that you have now? And then what about all the other stuff that's yet to come? Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. The, CI the fundamentals of CICD are the same with VMware, with um, what it was, Open, OpenStack, with, with, with Docker and with the next big thing, in the end of the day, the way we build the pipeline is always the same and the implementation details of how, we, how are we delivering is exactly that. Those are implementation details. So with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. As I, prom as I mentioned, I promise you, much more questions will be answered in the follow-up podcast that we will do, so don't miss that. Um, thank you very much, Kelsey. It was a, a, a honor and a pleasure hosting you. Thank you very much, Melissa, uh, and uh, we will see you in next webinars of JFrog and there was Pikisi podcast with those amazing guests. Thank you and bye bye. Thanks, everybody.